So, uh, hi, I'm Michael Dean from Hidden Beats, and I'm here with Jeff Burroughs, drummer from the Tea Party. Uh, Jeff, welcome. Thanks very much, man. Appreciate it. Uh, I just want to say what an honor it is, because uh, I'll never forget my first inter uh, my first rock concert was Ozzy Osbourne and the Tea Party. And so I've, I've seen you a few times. I've seen you with Crash Karma. I've probably bugged you after a show for autographs <laughs> and questions before. But now I've got your soul, uh, soul focus. Yeah, uh, which is crazy because you guys are are insanely busy. Uh, we've got the re-release of the Tea Party debut album coming out uh, yep. here in North America. We've got the the EP Sun Shower coming up, which is yep. being released as a full album in Europe. Um, I'm just wondering, like, with so many projects going on, uh, is there a <laughs> sense of anticipation when when these projects come out? Yeah, l lately, like you said, it's it's been crazy and it's been bananas. And beyond that, personally, um, I do a Christmas album every year, a holiday themed album for our community with a bunch of my friends, uh, which includes Mr. Chill from Big Sugar back in the day. And um, and we we do this album and the albums just came in. So now we have to like get those out and then we do a big show at christmas time for food banks and you know there's four to five thousand people at this show it's it's a big show so topped with that and these interviews and everything else and all of the stuff that's coming out it's been crazy and it's a very it's a it's a nice anxious you know what i mean like you've been so anxious the last year and a half because of all of the bs that's going on right now but um this is like nice to feel like that, that butterflies in your stomach, like you're a kid getting ready to go on a roller coaster or something, you know, it's pretty cool. I guess in that way, it's, it's, if you don't have a little bit of butterflies then something's not right. Like yeah. Like you're a little bit of nerve. <laughs> oh, I post, I tweeted something yesterday. Cause I, I truly am like, I'm just beyond grateful. But the, the fact is, is, you know, we've been doing this 30 plus years really, because when the indie came out, it was 91, but we were doing it in 90, just writing and learning and so on and so forth. But I mean, it's pretty damn cool to be relevant and to be able to release music and people want to buy it or download it. We, we got some news yesterday or the day before we were the number one, most downloaded Canadian song this past week. And then, and the number three most downloaded song in Canada regardless of whomever, like just behind Taylor Swift or something. I don't know her name, but anyway, um, Some know yeah, it, it's, it's, yeah, I've heard of her. Um, she, uh, and, and, and that sort of thing, it's, you gotta feel grateful. Like it's, it's, it's fantastic for me. Like if you said 30 years ago that I'd be doing it still in 30 years, you know, it's pretty amazing. And it's, it's quite an opportunity, quite a journey that you're allowed to be a part of. And I don't know, I think it's fantastic. It, it must be a good feeling as an artist when you have like second generation fans <laughs> yeah. of your music. When you've had oh, yeah. people that like and raised on Tea Party from their aunts and uncles or parents and getting into it. And with as much as the streaming platform is disrupted music, it's making it accessible to everyone. You're not wrong. And you know what? Like even in the early days, we had dads because our music was so very different from nirvana or that whole grunge era which was fine like the love the era obviously but we had guys that were my age like 50s bringing their sons who were in their 30s and 20s and now they're bringing their dad who's like a grandpa with their little kids so it's 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 pretty pretty cool man and you know life's life's a journey and and i and i've i caught a good good break on this one i guess <laughs> <laughs> i i find it so cool the the attention that the in, indie release is getting now the re-release an album that was 3500 copies some of yeah. which were released on cassette yep. uh, which the kids they're going to have to google afterwards what that means yeah and now getting the deluxe <laughs> vinyl multi-vinyl release across the world how how does that what does that say to the testament it, of the music, the creativity that 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 it's music it's is getting is popular. Yeah, you're right. It's getting so much attention. And the funny thing now, if you said in 30 years that's gonna come out on final, I'd be like, <laughs> why? What are you talking about? But it's such a big thing now. So vinyl and CD, yeah, and downloadable. Uh, it, it's really cool. Stuart did a, a really nice mastering job on it. So all the levels are bumped and it sounds it, it sounds as good as it can sound on the budget of, you know, $20 and a pizza. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it's cool though. I mean, for the, 
for the hardcore fans who who already have it or who have already heard the original uh, unmastered or unremastered version you know they know what they're getting and and i think they just kind of want it because you know when they were 16 they bought that or they always wanted to but we sold out of them and we couldn't afford to make any more <laughs> you know it was like oh that's that <laughs> i was got good. a bootleg tape of a tape of a cd uh, they heard in their friend's house no doubt so i i don't know i think it's I think it's great. I think we should bring back the old merch. I think Heck we should, yeah. you know, bring back the old, like I want to, I, I haven't seen an indie album tea party font tattoo yet. And I thought that'd be pretty cool. Cause you see so many times. You guys, yeah. <laughs> Get it. And we'll sign it. <laughs> and then we, we, can get that and, we can auction your arm <laughs> off. <laughs> Donate arm to science. <laughs> Oh, that's classic man that's great i can't wait it's it's so funny seeing all of this unravel all at the same time it's yeah I'm timing so is impeccable. Uh, yeah, switching gears to the new music uh yeah. sun shower the follow-up to black river yeah. was were these all written and recorded before the pandemic yeah yeah so black river ep was um the way we write nowadays uh is usually pre-tour and post-tour and we were heading to australia for one of the zillion tours that we do there and we showed up at jeff's place two weeks before and then we toured and then we wound up back at jeff's place and then we recorded and having having members live so far apart i mean it's not unusual but it's unusual for a band like the tea party but jeff's way out there so it, it just works out really well uh, for us to write there Stuart's in vancouver that's where we did this one and um Jeff flew in 12 hour flight. I flew over five hour flight and um, it was amazing. And it's nice because that's the best way we'd like to write jamming together. We, we did a couple um, covers when, you know, shit got nasty here in Canada with COVID and did um, uh, isolation, joy division and, uh, and a Morrissey cover as well. And um, we did those. Uh, where I do the drums here and then the files got sent to Jeff. And of course it was very easy. And because there were covers that we knew and used to play in high school and literally one take, but um, it, it, it was, there was not much fun in it. Like, I don't, I don't know how people can do that. If that's your, if that's your thing, I, I, I don't know. I, being in a band to me means you're together, you're in a room, you get sweaty, you get dirty, you're, you're going over and over and over apart and you, it, why isn't this working and then boom the aha moment happens and then boom everything settles into place that's the cool kind of stuff and that for me you know to be with my lifelong friends literally from high school and jeff and i since grade school playing together in grade school like in a band it's pretty pretty phenomenal most people don't get that opportunity and uh it's nice it's really nice and you know one of the joys of not living so close to each other is you know when we see each other it's like a great big it's a family reunion and our Special. crew yeah it, and you know we we love each other we're, we've been you know friends for so many years and when you can do a business i hate that part of it but you need you need that part of it to live when you do that it, and you're able to do it successfully it's it's pretty special especially if it's with friends right so and it, it, there must just be an amazing chemistry. Like you've said, you guys have been friends forever. And yes, there was the breakup, but Tea Party has been back for going strong for 10 years. Yeah. And it, and it seems like that magic is, is it feels like there's a, a genuine uh, love and appreciation between you guys when you're listening to it. You can hear you guys are having fun. Yeah. And and you know what? the the That rest, that seven year or six or seven year rest, whatever, um, that did us a lot of good. It really... I mean, if anything, it made us realize, well, A, we're acting like children. <laughs> B, um, we just had zero communication skills. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like a marriage. If you're, if you're in a band with a bunch of guys or a bunch of girls and guys or a bunch of girls, you have to have an, an extremely open line of communication. Assuming people think the same way as you is, is a grave mistake. And we were doing that. And um, once we got back together, we had, you know, these sort of quasi informal therapy sessions between ourselves, just really good talks and, and, you know, don't assume anything sort of thing. And, and I think it's helped us in the long run. It's, it's made us closer. We enjoy our company 
you know, much better. It, it's like, it truly is like being married. You know, I know it's cliche, but it's, it's a fact. You know? <laughs> oh, am I uh, always doing the damn dishes on the bus? No. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, it's your turn. <laughs> your turn to try. <laughs> One thing I've loved about the Tea Party is, while there is a, you, you put on a Tea Party song, you know it's a Tea Party song, but there's, you guys have always tweaked and played with your sounds, and as much yeah. as the infamous Moroccan roll, uh, but you guys have not, not been shy to mess around with different sounds. It, do you guys, is it like, okay, we're going to do something a little more electronic, or we're going to do something a little more Middle Eastern, or do you just jam and try something and just build and feed off it? Yeah, you're you're right on that last note. It, it the way things seem to go is we're in a room and we start writing and by the fourth song or idea that we're kind of getting down and we're kind of digging, it's like, okay, there's something, there's a certain lineage between these four songs, this theme sort of thing. And nothing is really lending itself this time to Eastern elements or electronics. So there we are. Uh, this this EP ended up being almost full circle to our first album or the indie album, to be honest. It's bluesier, heavier guitars, you know, rocking kind of thing. And I love it. And I love the fact that the people who enjoy our music expect the unexpected. Like you, you nailed it. it you, you, the Moroccan roll stylings and the electronic or the melodic sort of uh, wanderings of triptych. You know what I mean? It's it's very different every time. And I, I think these two last two EPs, um, they, they just kind of lended themselves more to that, you know, bluesy, rocking, having beers while we're writing music. You know, maybe we'll drink tea next time and, <laughs> and some mushroom tea. You know? <laughs> it really did have that rocking sound of, uh, and I, I heard a quote where it's described as, those songs could only have been written in the skyline of Detroit. Uh, yeah. Oh, I like and that. And it's true. Uh, uh, oh my God, it's escaping me now. The the release, the the single with Todd Kearns. Oh, hole in my heart. Hole in my heart. Uh, and yeah. it really does have that sort of grunge rock, which maybe people wouldn't at first think, or garage rock, maybe people wouldn't at first think of Tea Party, but it really is a Tea Party version of yeah garage jam rock. Yeah, it's just a dirty jam and. Yeah, fuck it. And it really needed Todd in there. And we've, we've been buddies with Todd for 25 years since the Age of Electric days. We, we had done the Edge Fests together and they were the only band that really wore as much black as we did. So <laughs> there's that symbiotic relationship we had. And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've, we've every time, like the Todd's originally, of course, from Saskatoon, but he made his home in Vancouver and he's often in Vancouver because his daughter still lives there. And so he's back and forth between there and, and Vegas. But whenever we play Vancouver, he seems to be there and he'll always come on and we'll jam welcome to the jungle and, and different songs. Um, usually Gene Genie and we have the Todd party, right? So having Todd on, on this one where, it, you know, really required the, the high notes um, uh, backgrounding Jeff's big baritone vocals. It just worked out really good. And, and we had him on a, uh, What's that? What's that? What song did we cover? Uh, off the tiles. We had him on off the tiles as well. Um, and he killed it. So it was a no brainer this time. We were just like, oh, well, let's get Todd in there. He, we don't usually have guests on the album, but TK is one of the, you know, he's a dude. He's, he's been our, he's been our bud forever. And he's like, yeah, man, what do you want? What do you need? I'll do it. <laughs> so you're not a real Canadian rock band until Todd Kearns has been on one of your songs. Exactly. You know, <laughs> Uh, one thing I Great did want to uh, go back to, because you mentioned at the beginning, um, people may not know, you have done an incredible amount of work in fundraising and benefits mm -hmm. and charities in your community. Uh, mm -hmm. I've always loved that you have stayed very close to your roots in Windsor. Um, I have friends of friends that have been helped by a charity. You've uh, supported a lot, Transition to Betterness, and you have done so much work. How how does it feel to give back to community? You have like you have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charities in Windsor. Uh, yeah. It must feel great to not only, you're not just putting out music, and yes, people love the music, but you're making real differences in the community. Well, so our our first real manager, manager Steve Hoffman, he he passed away at the age of thirty eight when we were thirty, maybe thirty four, thirty five, something like that. I think he was three years older, maybe a little more. 
And he was the one who first got us involved in the white ribbon campaign. Right. And we used to do the shows at the Phoenix and everybody would show up from Alex Lifeson to a couple of the bare naked lady guys, and David Usher, and then some of the headstones, just a great night. And of course, back then, all of those bands meant so much to so many people and Toronto was just on fire whenever we would do these, these shows. So that kind of made me realize, you know, when you're in a position to give back, like, you know, I'm not in the Foo Fighters, I'm not, you know, in Led Zeppelin, but I have a modicum amount of success. And if I can use that to influence and to raise money and to raise awareness and top of mind uh, within our community, then I'll do it. Because I, if I have the time, what else would I be doing? Like, if, if there's something that can be done, do it. So you know, I, like I said earlier, I do the charity album every year and, and the Christmas album, that's, that's food banks. And I still do work with, um, harmony or sorry, with uh, transition to better. I do a lot of work for, that's why I'm getting confused. Uh, transition to betterness. Um, we make a donation cause I'm a part of, um, blues fest Windsor and we host, um, a festival series, uh, for two weekends every summer. And we, we give back to them quite a bit. And now, I, I do my drum marathon as well every May. The last two have had to be um, online, mind you, or filmed at least, but I don't like doing that. I do 24 hours at a time. And, and most recently, they're all mental health initiatives. So there's six different smaller charities. Did I do six wrong? There it is. There we go. <laughs> I, <did that. laughs> I can't afford to get another charity in there. So six. <laughs> um, so, and, the, and those are mental health initiatives. And that's a lot of fun. And it, and the reason I started doing that is I wanted, uh, I was in radio at the time when the band took its break and I thought I should be still doing something like we started doing some good stuff. So let's keep doing some stuff. And I was touring so much previous to that, um, much more than now, because you're still young and hungry and really not that I'm not hungry now, but you know what I mean? It's just, this is the way it was back then. Um, I forget what I was going with this train of thought. Oh, and it gave me the opportunity to play and to meet all of these guys and gals in my community that I never get to see live. Like I've literally been on the road since 1992. And now it's 2000 and say five or where we now. Yeah. Five ish. And I really don't know anyone anymore. And the guys that I used to go see have either stopped playing or have passed away because I'd always be like blues musicians and stuff like that from Detroit. So it was nice because I, I'd meet these young bands and then I'd meet these guys that are my age that I've never seen play before and I have no idea who they are. And now I've got this network of amazing musician friends and they're always, I mean, there's one guy that has played every single year and um, I was going to quit doing this particularly, I think it was after the third year, only because there's so much preparation. Um, and and it, it, it's really hard to do. Like playing drums for 24 hours is really hard to do. And it, it, it takes its toll, both physically, mentally. I get stressed about it. You know what I mean? That whole thing. But he wrote me a letter and it was directly what you were speaking about with um, Transition, T2B, um, that his wife... Uh, was in there when she passed and he couldn't believe how amazing it was. And he was saying this um, to me right before he went on. And then he said it while he was on and he started crying and I'm crying, trying to play drums. And then from then on, I thought, no, I got to do this uh, at least for 10 years. And then we hit the 10th anniversary and the McDonald brothers from the trues came down and, and finished my last two hours and the crowd went bananas and then after that year, I thought, oh, I'll do it 20. So I'm on my, I think I've got, I think I just did 16. So 17, 18, 19, and 20. I got four more. I think I did 16 or 15, one of the two. So I either got four or five more years to do it. But it's those types of things. Um, like if I, I mean, I love playing and I love music. So if you can do something you love and you have the opportunity to raise money for, for those who need it, why wouldn't you do it? And, and that's always been my thing. And I've always taught, or both my wife and I, I've always taught our children that sort of thing. And now they're, they help out quite a bit. And I think what I did this year is I put it out that if you're a drummer in, within our county, 
but in another small town, so I got a guy in Leamington that's going to do it. He's going to do his own 24 hour drum marathon. And I've invited like the Windsor Spitfires out and I want them to donate me a few players and have a 24 hour shinny game out in the big parking lot and little kids can come and raise their money in order to play with the spits. You know what I mean? So I'm just coming up with different ideas to raise more money because there's nothing worse than getting stagnant when you, you start off in year one and it's, I think we raised $8,000. Now we raise 60, but this next year I want to hit a hundred. We're closing in on just that marathon alone. I think we're closing in on 600,000. Oh, wow. 700,000. So I want to start, you know, if it's the last five years, I want to do a half a million in those five years alone, plus what we've done, you know, previous to that. So, you know, it's not money driven. It's, it's driven by the passion for the community and, and the passion to those who, who need it. So it, it's, I'm, I'm lucky I, I get to do it. You know, it's not a yeah, difficult it, thing. And if anyone interested, the videos are out. Uh, I was watching some of the, the marathon videos. There's a lot of fun in there. Uh, as an artist, it must be pretty cool to just go through different, like you're just playing whatever genre comes up. Oh man, there's some time. So, so the last, the videos that you're seeing, those are the ones that we had to do online. So we couldn't do them 24 hours in a row. We had to go. So they were essentially 10 hour days, four 10 hour days in a row, six artists coming in, but under COVID restrictions. So the one person would play, finish playing for an hour, their mask could go back on, they would leave that all their stuff had to go. Then the next person would arrive and you know, you'd think, Oh, it's only six hours. No, those six hour days were 10 to 12 hour days and over four days. But my, my buddy, Gary uh, Demons, who normally books the bands for the 24 hours, he, he would throw some ringers in there for me sometimes. And there's this girl, um, the universe, according to Ray or something, she's out of London. And she is incredibly talented, but she is in the nicest of ways. She is bonkers, man. She is out there and her music is amazing. But I had no idea. Like the structure was, here's a song. I'm not going to play it like that at all. You know what I mean? And, and I had no idea where she was going. And then when she finished one and it was about 14 minutes long and she just turns around and it's like, ah. I'm like, that was incredible. She goes, yeah, it wasn't even a song. I was just jam. You co-wrote that with me right now. <laughs> I was like, what, what is happening? But those are the beautiful moments, right? Like you can't, you can't, buy that it's just those things happen and then and now if you're watching those videos half of them are are my friends from my charity band because there's a lot of goofing off um there's a really great little community group called um soul city music and uh it's run by mike hargraves and chrissy cochran both amazing musicians in their own right chrissy's charting and all the time um but they do a thing and they they um it's almost like a music incubator in windsor and they take all of these younger artists under their wing and they show them how to not only record but help them with writing styles and so on and so forth and then help them put their music out then help them with the marketing because the other person this one didn't work last time so let's try this instead because this seemed to work good with bubble and they they just mold and, and make things happen within the community. So they came and did six hours with me in different sections. So first it was one artist and then his girlfriend came because she's a member and then they did something together. Then he left and she stayed and it was just, it was amazing. But that that's what took a lot of work in the filming is like people coming in and out and, and so on. So, you know, it's amazing what happens when you start getting really involved with the community then you get bad things happen like people asking you to get into politics and stuff and i'm like what do you know my past no <laughs> jeff burrows 2022 uh, <laughs> it was a there's a provincial election coming up premier jeff make canada feel better <laughs> <laughs> i'll just i want to touch up on that christmas concert uh the Saints, uh, you have a performance coming December 23rd. As mentioned, the legendary Mr. Mr. Chill. Uh, yeah. He's just phenomenal. That must be a blast, just putting those together. He is the coolest man on earth. He really is. He walks into a room and everyone's just like, hey, Chill. You know what I mean? He's like, walks over, throws his harp on or his the strap of his sax. And, and he, we literally change songs 
structurally, um, usually in the guitar solo part. So the guitar solo part will be there, but in the live show, we'll say, okay, you're doing your whole show, but we're doubling the whole solo and chill's going to take that second half. Like he's, he's just so cool. And now we bring in, we always have a choir and they are usually, it's usually a minimum 20 to 25, but we've had as much as 35. And those are just people volunteering their time. And they're there. It's one section. It's usually, we save the choir for the last four or five songs and it's bombastic. Like you're in a, you're in the, the, the Coliseum, like it's 5,000 people and it's just so cool. And then we also bring in a horn section that I got in touch with my high school music teacher who I've always respected. I mean, I gave him a gold, my first gold album. Like when I, you know, he's such a great guy. He's a French horn player. So I asked him maybe six years ago, if he could put a horn section together. And so now that we have a horn section and they're on for usually four to five songs and then usually we bring in a drum line because we do little drummer boy, but this year because of COVID and we haven't even gone on sale yet, but there was just no time for any of that. And we were all, so I'm not going to talk about that though. We'll talk about that next year. I got something else that's really cool that we're going to be doing and that we really wanted to do this year. But, but again, COVID just kind of got in the way. So um, I can't wait. And, and it just puts everybody in touch again. You know, I just, we have a big party after, you know, crazy money gets raised for usually it's seventy five thousand dollars, and uh, fifty of it goes to Windsor, twenty five of it goes to Chatham, and it's phenomenal. And it takes it takes so many people to put it together. You know, the the college, the college alumni association, uh, La Unit sixty five, the laborers union are presenting it, and we couldn't do it without them this year because you know Caesars has been closed. So, you know, there's just tons of things that have to happen all of the planning and the strategizing sorry i'm just hit my cable there all the planning and strategizing you know really comes together uh about a month before and here we are and i just got a call and the cds are here so i got to go out and deliver cds now all right <laughs> just crazy uh, man that is one of the unfortunate things of covid is uh unfortunately the saints and sinners tour uh yeah. is another victim uh yep. with every now with all these albums coming out. Are there any plans in the in the works to get the tea party? Whether it's Saints and Sinners or just on your own, back out on the road? Yeah, I think I think it's on our own. I mean, I don't I don't think the Saints and Sinners idea is dead because I've wanted to do that for a long time because I thought that would essentially be like a mini edge fest. And I, in my pitch to management a few years ago when they put me down about it <laughs> i said in america you get bands not that my my style of bands or anything but you get bands like warrant and skid row and one other band of that ilk and they'll go out tour the whole summer and play sheds well that's amazing you don't might not have to like their music but these are guys and girls who love to play that's their style of music they get to earn a living and and get to play in front of a big audience again and fans love it and I, that was my original idea. And, but I don't think the Saints and Sinners is going to happen this tour. I know they're, they're looking at dates right now between July 10 and August 20 or something like that. And yeah, we're getting loads of offers because I mean, no one's really seen anything lately. Right. So. <laughs> and everyone wants to go back out. Yeah, uh, I know. One thing, <laughs> one thing I love with bands such as the tea party, it seems sometimes there's a cycle where bands grow and it's about growing, growing, growing. And then maybe there's like a pause or a moment of reflection, like there, there was the break. And now, and I see it kind of with the headstones too, where they just want to get out and play for the yeah. fans. And it's not about the $700 VIP ticket. It's let's get a bunch of guys or a bunch yeah. of bands, just go play, keep the tickets a decent price and go where they are, which is, yeah. is a great concept of the Saints and those ticket, Those tickets were really reasonable, weren't they, for four bands? I can't remember I what it was. Yeah. I can't remember what it was, but I know I had a pair. <laughs> Isn't it like a hundred hundred bucks plus whatever fees? I remember. It, but... I remember my two tickets. If it was over two hundred, it was just. Okay. It wasn't... See, that's that's a great deal. Like we go to Australia, just us, and it, tickets are minimum hundred dollars. It's crazy, but I don't know. I love that. I think that's great. That's it's it's the way to do it, man. Uh, and then maybe greedy to ask because, like you said, the two EPs, uh, the re-release. Are there any plans for new? new tea party or have you guys been have any ideas that have come about since the pandemic so usually what we do 
is right pre and post tour because Jeff lives so far away and Stuart lives so far away from here. So I can see us starting to write if we're going to be doing, like I said, the first thing coming up would be July 10 to August, whatever. We'll probably meet at Stuart's um, unless it's an East Coast start, but it's usually a West Coast start. We'll probably meet at Stuart's two, three weeks ahead and we'll start writing and jamming and do whatever we do and hopefully end up with four, five, six, seven really good songs. And then you go out on tour and that's a nice way to warm up too. Cause especially now, God, we haven't seen each other in two and a half years at that point. Um, so you go on tour, then you come back and then we'll just fly right back with Stuart. And then the wives will usually join. So Jeff wife will come in from Australia and, and my wife will come back with me. And, and so we all get a little bit of time off from the tour. So we'll all just stay together for whatever, five days, chilling out, you know, going out for dinners and stuff. And then, uh, then we just go back to work. So then if we end up with five songs or six songs, six, seven songs, is it EP or do we go album? And the only reason really we have been doing EPs is just, and it's, it's really just that difficult to get together and to write an album. And we don't want to not release something. So for us, it's, it's out of convenience. Um, it's very expensive to travel back and forth. It's very expensive to get into the studio for a month. You know, you don't want to do that. We want to get together with our, our, our ideas that we already have, bring them forth, work on them, record them once the tour is over, and then release it. And if you can do that in a perfect world without COVID, we can do that every other year. So right now, uh, that's what I expect or I hope would happen. If it doesn't happen before, I know it'll at least happen after because Jeff loves BC as well. And, you know he might stick around and do some solo dates, uh, you know, in the province of Van, uh, Vancouver, in the province of British Columbia. Right. So yeah, that, that's the way I can see it happening. So I, uh, you know, this is just coming out what Friday. So in two years, you'll have at least something again, or, or not even, I think in a year from now, you might have something again, which I hope, cause I love being, you know, uh, proactive when it comes to writing and prolific if we if we're able to be so i hope so too we'll book the next interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and it must be great that you guys do a lot of it in-house like Stuart, i guess does a lot of the the production on the music well he does he does a lot of the electronic percussion uh production jeff is the producer um proper and then um yeah i'm just a drummer <laughs> 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 but um yeah no it's it's a great it's a great organization that we have because yeah jeff jeff will uh produce it and then um this time we brought in a friend of ours who does the christmas albums actually he mixes them his name's martin back and he's phenomenal um and Stuart had worked with him a little bit with me when he was down in windsor <clears throat> and one a tea party song came out came out of that but i can't remember which one it was I think it was on the ocean at the end album, like seven years ago, but um, there are two peas in a pod, him and him and Stuart. They're very, very uh, smart, very quiet, um, very techy, and they get so much shit done. And so we brought Marty and they liked the way the Christmas album sound. Cause that's not easy either. We got nine members plus horns and a choir and he's mixing all of this. And man, he just killed uh, this latest EP. I think it sounds so good and fat and, like dirty, like on that hole in my heart hot track. It's like, man, that's grit, man. Yeah. And that, so, I mean, I know I'm playing that a ton and it's, it, it's getting a lot of play. I've heard on the radio a few times too, which has been amazing. Yeah. Cool, man. I love that. Love it. I was wondering, uh, where did, when you were first beginning drumming, what was your inspiration? Like, who were you listening to when you were well, starting out? So I, I, I did, um, uh, piano for four years conservatory piano for four years and then I found drums under my dad's workbench that I had never seen before and my dad was a drummer and well now he's still a great drummer but now he collects and refinishes and helps people in the community for free ridiculous but he works so hard and he's got he's got a collection of snares it's got to be got to be a hundred I think he's got a hundred different snares like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars like worth of snares and some really crazy ones um so he was my first inspiration but then of course you know growing up in the uh 80s primarily with drums it was Stuart copeland and bonham and peart all all of the usual suspects but one nice thing that i had 
um, because my dad was a drummer is the fact that um, he was right into Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa and Max Roach nice. and Ed, Ed Shaughnessy and all the jazz guys. And for me, that was very eye opening because, you know, doing a simple rock beat is that doing a simple jazz beat is, you know what I mean? And it's like so spastic. And I thought, that's just like a normal beat. And he's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's just how they do it. I was like, wow. And then with the advent of the internet, and then I could just watch these guys anytime I want. Oh, I was like, this is really crazy. So I'm a very, there's a lot of, there's so many great rock drummers out there, but I'm a very swing style rock drummer. And I groove in and out of that tempo. Um, and that's, I think, that influence from the jazz side. So you know, there's, there's a lot out there. You wouldn't know it that I'm influenced from jazz seeing me play, but if you, if you really listen to, if you started the tempo of that song and you felt how much I push and then really pull back with our downbeats and upbeats, you'd notice that, you know, so it's pretty cool. I, especially when, uh, for those who've had the joy of hearing the tea party live, when you get those awesome, like a, a jam version of a tea party song, yeah. it's just like, okay, when, when you're keeping the groove going for a seven minute, while uh, Jeff and Stuart are taking turns going crazy. It's like, yeah. you can't do that with just a regular rock beat. No, man. We Save Me used to talk, clock in around 26 minutes when we were kids. And I was like, all right, <laughs> I'm starting to see myself. I'm teleporting <laughs> over myself right now. We got to get out of this groove, which is a great groove. I love playing it, but I, it was almost transcendental. I was almost like getting lost. Where am I? Am I? am I actually doing this right now? I better pay more attention to what I'm doing kind of thing. So I remember that specific night. It was at Lee's Palace uh, way back in the earlier 90s. And I just thought, okay, we got to chop this song down a little bit. But I know that though, but that's nice because people, you know, we get to jam and people enjoy it. And, uh, you know, it's it makes the live show special. You're not just hearing, okay, it's, it's mm. three and a half minutes on the CD. It's three and a half minutes at the show. You go to the show, you're going to hear them doing it in a different beat is they're going to add verses in put extended mm -hmm. solos in and it really makes it special yeah it really changes it up and that's the nice thing like we're not married to uh backtracks we're not married to anything like that you won't see many bands do jams anymore unless you're labeled a jam band because you are literally married to the tracks it, you know the keyboards are playing magically how does that happen well with a tea party it's stewart's feet or it's me programming something on the on the, the pads and I'm playing the pads. I don't like just going and it's going. No, I'm playing it. You know what I mean? And Jeff's assortment of pedals and instrumentations and so on. And this that's that's the way it should be done. I know there's a be. There, there's a place, there's a place for that. And and I get it. Um, but it's just not for us. And, and there's a place for musicians that play musical instruments their, their instruments yeah <laughs> i can stay at home and press a button on my ipad <laughs> yeah exactly you know <laughs> uh, one thing i'm always curious uh with artists that have such a big back catalog are there any sort of um kind of classic tea party songs that that you really still get amped up about that every time it comes up on the set list you're like oh, i still love playing this song even if it's the ten thousandth time i've played temptation well well, you know what's, know what's changed for me over the years <clears throat> is I'm now singing backup vocals in most, I'll say half the songs. So the songs that I was getting tired of, like Heaven Coming Down, and you have to play it because it was a big hit. Um, but I was so bored of playing it. And it's, it's not a very exciting song. But now I'm singing backups in it. So I'm like, this is great. Here's my moment. And I'm, you know, off mic, I'm like, me, 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 me. And then I'm like, ah. <laughs> and temptation and so on and so on. So that, that's that been the, the kind of fun thing for me um, because you do have to play the staples, right? Um, and, and that is one way that has helped me not, you know, get tired of the song so much. But there's some songs that I wish we could play way more but just people just don't know them you know like um requiem the song we wrote for our manager who passed away we do that song that song is transposed for a 78 piece orchestra so we did an orchestra tour in canada we most recently did one with the melbourne symphony orchestra and the sydney sydney uh sydney symphony orchestra and every time we do that song i tear up like it's it's so so beautiful and it's just not really well known. You know what I mean? It's just one of those tracks and it, it, 
it gives me shivers just thinking about it, you know, and it was played at his funeral and his folks were crying and it's just, it's one of those beautiful, beautiful moments. So yeah, there's, there's a few songs like that. And I wish we could play a little bit more, but you know, you got to spread it out. You got to, you got to do, right. we got to do more symphony shows. <laughs> Let's do some more symphony shows. <laughs> I've heard other artists and that they mentioned sometimes the difficulty, especially if you have like a, maybe like a Saints and Sinners or you're doing a festival tour and you've got, okay, you're not just, you're not just making a set list for the diehards. People are going to expect to hear the big singles and you want to appease the diehards with it's very the deep difficult. cuts, the B-sides, but then the casual fans be like, I don't remember this song. Yeah, no, it, the festival sets are exactly that. It's like, just we go through the albums. So it's like, okay, it's The River, um, Save Me, and then let's do uh, Fire in the Head and The Bazaar, and then let's do Temptation and Psycho Pomp. And then, you know what I mean? Then having come down, you just kind of do all the math in your head. And, okay, now we still need three more. What will kind of sort of please <laughs> the diehards and won't completely turn off the casual fan? And so you just try to find something cool that is very riffy or the drums are really great or they're Stewart's featured. And, and, and yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of how you lay it out, but you nailed it. I mean, and, some, and it's shocking how they don't realize that. Like, <laughs> Why aren't you playing this song? Well, because it's our it's our tour. We can do whatever we want. But when you go to see us in festival, you're guaranteed you're going to see Heaven Coming Down. But I remember we did a show. We didn't play Heaven Coming Down. And man, we, we got blasted the next day on, online. I was like, what the hell? I saw Russian. They didn't play Spirit of Radio. I didn't take it online. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> if you want the song man. that much. Yeah. Uh, just... <laughs> I, I'm the same way. It's on mantras. Uh, only because uh, on a personal note, I'll, I'll never forget. I was going through a very rough time. And walking through the streets of north bay and i had my headphones on listening to interzone mantras in a yeah. very not good moment of my life and just hearing that album and i had it just on loop because i had a mini disc player which no one oh, knows yeah. what those are anymore so yeah, i only yeah. had the one album with me and it really the the melody and just that that perfect moment really helped me uh sorry this is totally off topic no, I just this is to great. thank it's you good conversation uh, yeah that, thank you man those songs like really helped me get through some really rough times, uh, which is one of the reasons I was was so fascinated with seeing the work you do for the mental health groups. Mm. Um, and I said it, I said it earlier, but it, it must be great as an artist, like not just your art, but the actions you do have have touched and helped so many people. Well, anyone in that you could be a sports figure, you could be an artist, you could be an actor, you can be a politician. I mean, everyone has time. If people say they don't have time, they're fucking lying. You know what I mean? Everybody can make time. Time is 10 times more valuable than money. And that's why I put in the time because just by doing it, like even the marathon, for instance, again, by doing it, say you don't raise as much money as you wanted, but that doesn't matter. People remember it because now the press is talking about it and they'll come and visit me like at hour 12 and then hour 18 and so on. And gradually watching the, you know, the, the, the collapse of Jeff Burroughs behind the drums and, <laughs> and, but they talk about it and then they share the links that if you want to share with any of these, go right ahead and do so now. And then they get that other little bump afterward. So, and if they, they know that, you know, I'm supporting it and they happen to be a fan, then they'll help support it too, but it's in their own community, but it's, it's a woman's shelter or it's a center for abused women. Well, they can do that in their own community as well, but they thought of it after, seeing it on a YouTube or seeing it live or seeing something that I posted from a newscast or, or, you know, a, a zoom interview, it's the same thing. So it gives that spark. It lets people know, like, like you said, anyone can do it. it. Just, it's just a matter of getting out and doing it. Yeah. And do it with, do it with some friends. Like it's, it's not easy it, and it's very time consuming, but uh, it's well worth it. That's for sure. And it's like, if guys that like, <laughs> You, you don't sound like you have any free time. And if someone like yourself can be involved in so many projects. Oh yeah. You there's, there's free time. I mean, work hard, play hard. Um, and, and sometimes volunteer hard. <laughs> <laughs> and as a fan, that it makes it so much more enjoyable to keep what, what I find when I know an artist uh, are good, are good people are doing stuff. It makes it, it makes me more of a fan. It makes me want to yeah. support those artists even more. Well, Cause good. I know. 
Well, good, good, good support's good. good. It really is. It, good support's good. If you're a good human, that's, and maybe that's why Canadian bands do so well. I mean, uh, from every genre, from country to pop to this to that in America, uh, except the tea party, everybody blows up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, because we're so kind traditionally and ever anyone can, can do anything. You know, I've got enemies guaranteed, rest assured. <laughs> There's plenty of them out there. Haters, but you know, I don't, you don't care. I don't concern myself with any of that. I, I do what I can do. I forget shit. I remember stuff, you know, you just, whatever. I mean, it seems in Canada, like uh, you, you need that support to go. Like we're, we're such a spread out and yes, we got 30 some million people, but stretch across such a vast area. You need yeah. that support to grow. And those connections you make with people that help you go from selling cassettes and yeah. one in the morning on a oh, Saturday yeah. night in Windsor <laughs> oh, yeah. to now, Jet setting yeah. to Australia with a symphony behind you. It, all those yeah. people that helped the Tea Party get there have yeah. have followed you through all of that progress. Yeah, that's yeah, that's special. Thank you for reminding me of that. I like that. It's a fact, and and it's usually the wives that were selling the merch back in the day <laughs> and loading drums. <laughs> She's like, "I was your first roadie. Don't you forget it." <laughs> if you'll be my girlfriend, you're going to help me sell T-shirts. Call me the merch. <laughs> I got a trip to Kitchener for you. <laughs> hey, hey, big spender. <laughs> well, I, I, I've taken up about an hour of your time. Uh, Jeff, I just sincerely wanted to thank you for, uh, for giving me this time, for letting me kind of oh, chat pleasure. over this. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I am one of the many looking forward for the full release of, of the upcoming EP and uh, being able to enjoy some more new Tea Party. And I think I speak for everyone. We, we all can't wait to see the Tea Party live on the road. Oh, me too. Thank you very much, man. Uh, I like this style of interview. It was very nice. <laughs> and thank you for reminding me of, of all the good people that have helped us along the way. I really appreciate that, too. And we'll just give one last shout out. <clears throat> December 23rd, uh, the Caesar in Windsor. The Saints. Yep, Caes Coliseum at Caesars Windsor. And, yeah, and it's the Saints. Tickets go on sale at Ticketmaster Friday as well. Yeah, another Friday thing. And then they can go to the box office if you're having to be in Windsor starting Monday, I think. So, yeah. So best of luck. And a with shout out show. and a shout out to all those great Canadian rock stations, right? Heck Who yeah. loves you? <laughs> Who loves you, baby? Hey, look, everyone, make sure to go make requests for tea party. Oh, nice hey, little show. Come on, guys. Here we go. Holding my heart straight to number one. <laughs> all right, man. I appreciate it. I'll Thank let you, you go. for your time, Jeff. Take care. All right, ciao, Bye. Just the end.